What's up, everybody? Welcome to Breaking Biotech. So glad to be with you guys today on this midweek Breaking Biotech episode. Did uh, not have a chance to get to one on the weekend, but that's okay. Uh, the topic at hand took me a little bit extra time to look into before I felt comfortable talking about it, and uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, glad to be with you guys. Uh, been an exciting past few weeks, actually. A lot's been going on, so I had to tailor the news section to make it pretty much the, the most relevant stuff because there's a lot I want to touch on, and I think I'll talk about it later when um, it's more relevant for us. But uh, yeah, so we'll touch on the news, and then I'll get to the feature of today, which I'm going to talk about Immunomedics, which is a company trying to tackle triple negative metastatic breast cancer. So we're going to skip the portfolio overview because it is a midweek episode, and I don't have it in me to do an extra special midweek uh, assessment of my portfolio as it is, but the XBI continues to underperform a lot of indices, so it, uh, it's not looking great. Okay, so with that, let's talk about the news. So in the last few weeks, we had some prints come out from the U.S. Uh, generally, the, the most important one was the CPI that I was concerned about because we worry about inflation being a real issue, especially with the tariffs coming through or the threat of tariffs. A lot of people have been suggesting that just the threat of tariffs are going to cause manufacturers to increase their prices and we would expect to see an increase in CPI, but it hasn't really been the case uh, as of yet. So that's generally a good thing in terms of consumerism. Um, we have seen the, the stock market continue to rally higher, so that's a, a type of inflation, or at least um, at least market inflation that we tend to see. The Federal Reserve had a meeting, and they announced that they're going to leave rates unchanged, but they are hinting, at least based on these dot plots, which... Uh, each member gets to vote on, on what they think they're going to do next meeting, and it looks like there's going to be a rate cut in July, so the market really rallied on that news of um, increasing liquidity in the markets. So that uh, seemed to help everything except for the XBI, unfortunately, but um, it is what it is. So in the biotech world in particular, we saw that Pfizer bought Array in $11.4 billion deal for a targeted cancer therapy against this BRAF mutation. And AbbVie uh, showed their intent to buy Allergan in a $63 billion deal. So I don't have too much to say on the Pfizer deal. Uh, $11.4 billion, um, pretty large. But this just shows that targeted therapies seem to be a pretty hot area. So that's relevant for our talk today because Immunomedics is a targeted cancer therapy company. So I think when we look at, at high potential M&A targets, you want to look at what's been acquired in the past, and it might be worth it to, to shift your focus on those types of companies if that's going to be your strategy to exit. So I took this tweet from Andy Biotech, who's always been a legend on Twitter, and he wrote out all the, uh, the last 30 months' worth of targeted companies that have been taken over. $36 billion in M&A in the past 30 months. So it's, uh, it is an area where larger companies are happy to scoop up little ones for that extra extra boost in, in revenue or potential revenue. Regarding the AbbVie and Allergan deal, uh, $63 billion. So really the only thing that I have to say is, you know, they, they see a lot of potential in Botox. And uh, I, I agree with some of the, the analyses that are out there that Botox is relatively hard to create a biosimilar for, even though there's other companies out there making a, a version of a neurotoxin to help with with aging side effects. I think AbbVie is pretty much banking on this cash cow continuing to to produce results. Otherwise, Allergan doesn't have too much that they can hang their hat on. They have, you know, they have uh, some neurological disorder drugs as well as some uh, GI related drugs and a bunch of eye drops. So uh, I don't know, they've had a lot of bad luck in, in trials and they have that Nash drug that I was I was looking into in hopes of, of shorting the company. And I gotta say, I tweeted uh, that I'm very glad that I didn't short Allergan because you could really get killed in this in this game. So the other thing that, that I noticed is, you know, $63 billion. That could have been spread a lot more thin to scoop up some some great companies out there, ones that I would have liked to to see get picked up and uh, and quit bag holding. But it, it is what it is. It's hard to tell exactly why uh, the larger pharma does what they do, but I uh, it, it is an interesting thing. 
All right. So in other news related stuff in uh, the Nash space, we, we saw two events that happened, I think, uh, in the last in the last week or so. But Contravir's CRV 431 decreased fibrosis and key biomarkers in liver disease in some pivotal experimental model. And this is their cyclophilin inhibitor drug. I don't think cyclophilin has been characterized too well in different disease states. So it's kind of a, a unique area that, that I really don't have too much uh experience in but it's worth looking into and i say that specifically because the market cap they're trading at 3.3 million dollar valuation so if we're looking at the nash space as a whole uh, a company that just saw positive data in kind of a phase one ish type trial valued at 3.3 million it's very very low valuation compared to the big hitters that we see out there intercept which obviously these are much closer towards clinical approval but we got to look uh, towards the future a little bit. So they raised cash just after they released this data and then announced this positive feedback uh, from the FDA in response to pre-IND meetings. It looks like they're going to be able to, to submit an IND and, and start a phase two trial or something like that. I might buy 100 shares worth just because their, their valuation seems pretty low compared to other companies in the space. Even Canadis that just decided that they were going to suspend their trial after a Nash failure, they're still valued at, at like $9, nine million. So uh, I'm going to look a little bit more into into Contravere, suffice to say. But And just for comparison, Viking sitting at a $500 million market cap, Magical at 1.52, and Intercept at 2.56. So um, I think I might do a, a video to follow up and, and just do a recap in the Nash space since so much has changed. These trials take forever, unfortunately, so it seems like it, it's slow to move. And I feel like I've been holding these companies for, for a long time, but I think it will pay off in the end. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get to our feature topic for today, which is Immunomedics. And they're a cancer company, market cap of $2.54 billion as of today, trading at $13.28 per share. They have a targeted cancer treatment based on their antibody drug conjugate therapy. They basically just want to tether something, could be chemotherapy, could be a cytokine, could be a toxin and they want to attach that to an antibody that's going to hone to a cancer cell. And, you know, they, they talk about it in broad terms, but they really have one product that they're hoping to, to use in different types of cancer. And I shouldn't say they just have one product, they have multiple ones, but the one that they're focusing on anyway is this Sazituzumab Govetican, or MU-132. And this is an anti-trope 2 antibody that is, that is expressed on a lot of different cancer cells. Um, it's highly expressed on those cells, and it's attached to this SN38 chemotherapy. And this is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. This SN38 is 2 to 2,000 2, times more potent than uh, irinotkin, which was a drug that was going through trials. What Immunomedics decided to do was to attach this highly potent version to an antibody in a, in a 7 to 1 ratio. So these antibodies have these... Uh, molecules attached to it through a cleavable linker that allows the cell to, to cleave this this drug and allow the drug to to do its work on the topoisomerase. So in this way you could technically treat a lot less of the drug as a whole um, but also get very effectiveness because it's it's a targeted therapy so it should circulate through the blood and attach to these trope 2 molecules on the cell, and then the, the SN38 will be able to do its work there. So you get fewer side effects, uh, hypothetically, and you get more effectiveness. So their, their main indication that they're looking for is in metastatic triple negative breast cancer, and they submitted a BLA for this mid-2018, and then they received a CRL from the FDA in January of 2019, and they say it's specifically related to the chemistry, manufacturing, and control, and has nothing to do with the clinical data. So that's good news for, for the company. But we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the future. So to get an idea of what we're talking about in triple negative breast cancer, uh, cancer is staged 1, 2, 3, 4. Stages 1, 2, and 3 could be resectable, which is you can do surgery and they'll just cut it out. Um, stage 3 and stage 4 can be unresectable, where th wherein the tumor is more diffuse, so there's not just like a solid thing that the surgeon can take out. On the first line, you know, you have 10,000 10, to 11,000 patients. Second line, it goes down. And then third line patients, which is what the company is hoping to get the indication for, there's about eight to 9,000 patients. 
So they're looking in the future to do combination therapy with checkpoint inhibitors. That's what the CPI is here. So this is all potential, but the, the patient group that they're starting with are these third line patients. So they've received two other types of therapies already in these, these late stage cancer diagnoses. In terms of breast cancer as a whole, metastatic triple negative breast cancer makes up 15 to 20% of cases. And the relapse pattern is unique in that it's, uh, it's much higher in the first three to five years, but then drops sharply below that compared to hormone positive cancers afterwards. And I think the reason for this is that triple negative breast cancer is very heterogeneous. And it kind of makes sense. If you're categorizing cancers based on their hormone positivity or their their receptor positivity, you're going to really have a, a specific prognosis and relapse pattern that, that you can pick out. But if you're just negative for these, you could be positive for a whole bunch of other things that aren't taken into account. And because it's so heterogeneous, after you're treated with one line of therapy, you only kill the cancer cells that are susceptible to that therapy. And if the tumor is heterogeneous, then you're likely to get proliferation of those other cells that will then make up the bulk of the secondary tumor. And then you need to undergo another line of therapy. So it does make sense, uh, hypothetically, but this isn't super relevant for what we're talking about today because we're going all the way to third line treatment. So uh, ignore those dogs barking. So the low response rates that exist in triple negative breast cancer um, are usually in the second or third line. So the first line um, treatment here, you get about a 30% objective response rate, uh, progression-free survival of around three, three to four months, and then overall survival of uh, 12, 11 months. If you move on though, after the first line treatment, we can see that the objective response rate goes down to about 10%, which is uh, pretty disappointing. And the progression-free survival in terms of months is only about two, one to two months. So the uh, the company is looking to, to help patients in this area by um, increasing the response rate and uh, increasing the, the length of survival um, progression-free. So if we look at the data they have that's, that have been included in the biologics license application, that's what the, the BLA stands for, in patients that have received uh, three or more previous treatments, they get an objective response rate of 33%, which is you know, double or triple what we see in, in the typical two or more treatments, according to their data here. So that's quite nice. They, they see a median duration of uh, response of 8.3 months or 6.7 according to this Blinded Independent Central Review and progression-free survival of 5.5 months. So that's quite a bit better than what we see uh, currently here. And that's what's reflected in the, the CRL, or at least what they tell us that the CRL says in, in reference to efficacy of the drug not being a problem. So it does seem like they just want to make sure that the durability of the compound or anything to do with the manufacturing is sound so that they can get minimal batch to batch variability moving forward. So this this makes me think that the they actually have something here, at least in, in this indication. They're they're looking at seven indications though. So the BLA is being submitted for third third line or more cancer treatments, and then they're doing a phase three trial to confirm their phase two results. So this BLA is based on phase two data and they're looking to get confirmatory data in this ASCEND trial. So other ones that they're looking at is urothelial cancer. They, they see good data in um, HR positive, HER2 negative breast cancer. They also want to do these checkpoint inhibitor combos, PARP inhibitors, as well as this basket of what they say related to lung cancer and endometrial cancer and HCC. So they have a lot of lofty ambitions, but based on the model that I put together, I think that if they're able to get approval in two of these related to sesotuzumab, their their stock price should increase to about 25 or 30. They have two other products that they, they didn't touch on at all in their most recent corporate presentation, this MU-130 and MU-140. And these are just different antibodies. They're still bound to the SN38 molecule, but they're different antibodies. So it seems like their focus is really going to be on this sazituzumab moving forward. Although anybody can chime in and tell me what's going on with these, because it doesn't seem like they're doing anything with them since the publication of the colorectal cancer paper that they put out showing some efficacy. And I wasn't able to find anything on the hematologic cancers. So 
Um, that's that. But I, uh, I do think that they, they have some potential for at least for the stock to increase if they get su- uh, success in the BLA as well. But I'll touch on that in, in just a second. So I did want to also mention that there's competition in triple negative breast cancer. I found three different companies that are working on it, but I'm sure there might be more. So this is something to keep in mind. Roche has a trial going on right now with their PDL1 CPI plus this taxane type drug. Merck is also using Keytruda as a monotherapy. It failed, but they're doing it in combination with uh, a taxane. So there's there's definitely some competition in this area. And if Immunomedics is able to get approval, it doesn't mean that they're going to get this entire eight to nine thousand patients. So yeah. And then I also found this cytodyne company that has an antibody, and I think this has been used in in an HIV treatment. But they're trying to block CCR5 in in hopes that that is a, a molecule that. Uh, helps with triple negative breast cancer. So that's also a potential competitor. So given all of this, my my verdict and what I might do, and again, none of this is investment advice and it's subject to change at any time. There's a lot of things that can go on. The company might need to dilute shares or there could be more extended FDA issues. But what I'm thinking of doing is buying in late 2019 or probably Q1 of 2020. So they're hoping to resubmit the BLA in Q4 of this year. And if that is the case, the longest that it'll take the FDA to approve or not will be, I think, six months. They could get a two month review, but I think that's kind of unlikely. But in order to, you know, to not worry about that, I'm thinking of buying an early Q1 of 2020. So if that's the case, I think their stock is likely to go back up to about uh, 18 or 19, where I think it was before they got the CRL. And then I think in 2020, they're expecting to get positive data for urothelial cancer, as well as this HER2 negative and ER positive indication. And this would expand the patient population to quite a bit larger than what they have now. And based on my assumptions and the, the model I put together, based on a certain price that I used from other cancers in, in third line and second line, I think I could expect the, the share price to go to around 25 or 30 in, uh, by the end of 2020 or early 2021. So that's the uh, that's the theory I have going on, and a lot could change in that time, but that's kind of where I'm at. And just to show the data for urothelial cancer as well as this ER positive and HER2 negative, uh, I thought I'd put this up from their corporate presentation. So they say here in uh, urothelial cancer, comparing it to second line, they, they see a subjective response rate of 31%, which is quite a lot better than the, the taxanes, and progression-free survival is also quite high. And then if we look at HR positive or HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, we also see a a large improvement with uh, sazituzumab compared to the other therapies. So I think these have a high likelihood of being approved, especially if the original BLA gets approved and uh, and we see that in mid-2020. That's where I'm at with the company. Things to watch this week. Tomorrow is the Q1 GDP announcement, so that's definitely going to be a market mover if it strays much farther than expectations. We also have the G20 in Japan on June 28th and 29th. We've already seen some headlines come in. I think uh, Mnuchin was was quoted as saying they're 90% there to a deal with China. I'm talking about the China trade deal that we keep waiting for. Who knows if it's true? Um, it's just really hard to predict, but this could be a big market mover. And then, yeah, I've got a list of companies to look at. I did take a position in uh, Axivant. And if you read my article from, God, I don't know how many years ago it's been, but I uh, one of my first loves was the short of Axivant on their Alzheimer's drug back in the day. And they rebranded as a gene therapy company. And I tweeted about how they boosted quite a bit on news of a manufacturing partnership. So I'm really, I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for any gene therapy companies that are relatively fairly valued or undervalued because it seems like uh, any chance of them being a target of a takeover might increase the stock quite a bit. And I think that might happen again with, with Axivant. And I know it is a, a high risk bet, but that's why I'm only putting a few shares in. So yeah, and uh, that's all I got for you guys. But I want to thank everybody for watching and listening. And please like, subscribe, or leave me a comment. And yeah, we'll see you next time.